So once, what is that noise? Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Crew Trime. Crew Trime. It's Crew Trime, baby. If you are new here, hello. <laughs> my name is Sarah and what I do here is tell you a terrible story to ruin your day and put on my makeup while I do it. <laughs> if that sounds good to you, then go ahead and subscribe, hit the bell notification, and that way you won't miss any of my uploads. So we're gonna shift gears a little bit today and take a break from the bleak, gruesome, terrible, murderous, all the things that you guys like for some reason. <laughs> so this one is still a crime, but a little more fun, I guess. <laughs> it's a good old fashioned robbery. In today's video, we are going to the great state of Nevada, the home of Sin City, Las Vegas, baby. <laughs> so there are many casinos all across the United States, but Las Vegas is certainly the epicenter of American gambling. So we've all seen a million movies about card counting poker players and robberies and crooked dealers, mob bosses, elaborate heists, ransoms, so many things. But are those just for the movies or have there ever really been any successful casino heists? Well, the short answer is, hell yeah, <laughs> a lot. And we're still covering crew crime state by state, so this is the selection for Nevada. I haven't even told you what the story is yet. This is the story of the biker bandit. So in the true spirit of Las Vegas, we are gonna, you know, we're gonna gamble a little bit and let Lady Luck choose my makeup. <laughs> I just went online and found like a wheel that you can program and I put in some eyeshadow palettes. I put in the Naked Reloaded, the Trixie Bottle Blonde, the Jaclyn Hill Morphe Volume 2, that one's super bright, um, the Huda Beauty Mercury, Mercury Retrograde, why can't I say that word? The Sydney Grace Be Mine and the Estate Cosmetics Resort palettes, so a good variety of fairly new items, I think. I don't know. I don't know things. I don't know anything about anything. Naked Reloaded is not new at all. <laughs> Anyways. Okay, the Sydney Grace Be Mine palette. Here it is, I have not used it at all, I don't think. Wow, it's really dark. Pretty deep colors, I don't know, it's like mauve romantic colors. We'll see what we can do. So, I don't need to like gamble for everything. I already know what foundation I'm gonna use. Anyway, so we have this eyeshadow palette. So this is newish from Sydney Grace and this came out around like Valentine's Day and Michelle Wong sent it to me because she's so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> this is the vibe today. So if you're interested to see any of the rest of the makeup that I use, just look down in the description box because it's all down there for you. Okay, so I originally was gonna do like a top five casino heists, but when I was doing the research for this case, there was enough to make it kind of its own story. So here we are. Well, let me secure my bangses. So a lot of the details of this story actually came from an incredible article from Rolling Stone written by Keith Romer in 2016. So if you're interested to read that article, I will link it down below. On Tuesday, December 14th, 2010, just before four in the morning, 29 year old Anthony Michael Carleo rolled up to the Bellagio Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas on his Suzuki motorcycle. He parked right near the valet stand and he parked his motorcycle in such a way where it was like facing out for easy access. So the Bellagio Hotel and Casino is a Las Vegas landmark. It's the one that you think of when you think of Las Vegas casinos. It's got like that giant fountain outside that does like the big show and it was in Ocean's Eleven. Oh, that's funny. I didn't even realize this until just now. This story is a Las Vegas story. Michelle Wong is in Las Vegas. She sent me this palette and it was randomly chosen. Meant to be. <laughs> okay, so Anthony Carleo has arrived at the Bellagio, whatever. Wearing black overalls, a backpack across his chest, like wearing it backwards, rubber gloves, and his white motorcycle helmet. With the visor still down, he entered the casino. In Vegas, or I mean like any casino, anywhere really, there are cameras literally everywhere. You know, you can't pick a wedgie <laughs> without a team of people watching you, so. So him leaving that helmet on was part of the plan. Anyways, inside his left front pocket 
was a handgun. So once inside, he went straight to the high stakes craps table and he pulled out the gun. Everybody jerked back, like <gasps> terrified, of course. Tony just stuffed the backpack with poker chips. Each stack is a different color and each color denotes a different value. Now at the Bellagio's high stakes table, these chips ranged in value from $1,000 each, $1,000 each, to $25,000 each. And those $25,000 ones are a cranberry color or crans as the players like to say. Okay, so Tony has stuffed this backpack filled with all of these chips and then he hurried back to the front door using like waving the gun around to clear his path. Now we now know that that gun was unloaded but nobody else knew that. You see somebody running around waving a gun, the gun wins. In the span of about three minutes, maybe even a little less, he was in and out of that casino and had taken $1.5 million worth of poker chips. <laughs> So because Tony Carleo was in and out of the casino with his biker helmet and escaped on a motorcycle, he became the biker bandit. Five days before this happened at the Bellagio. Whoa, that's juicy. Now, five days before that hit at the Bellagio, the biker bandit robbed the poker room cashier at the Suncoast Casino for almost $19,000 in cash. So the Suncoast casino is much smaller than the Bellagio. So he was able to take the cash, get on his motorcycle that he had cleverly staged outside of like a side exit door. And then he zoomed away, scot-free. So that robbery was really all he needed, you know, the confidence booster to go even further. And that's why he went after one of the biggest casinos on the strip, the Bellagio. Let's back it up a little bit. Who was this guy? Tony Carleo kind of fancied himself a hustler, and he was. He was later described by people who know him as like a look at me kind of a guy, you know? Needs attention, big ego. So Tony was not a local. Well, not an, a native local. He grew up in Pueblo, Colorado. His parents were divorced. He lived with his mom and stepfather. He graduated from Pueblo High School in the class of 2000 and was voted class clown. Surprise. I think he was actually voted most likely to not succeed. Is that really a superlative at a high school? That seems not nice. <laughs> so Tony's stepfather, Gino, was business partners with his younger brother, Louis, and they were in the real estate business and they were very successful. One report claimed that they pretty much owned half of downtown Pueblo. They also may have had ties with organized crime, or at least like the influence of organized crime in the city, whatever that means. Uncle Louie was kind of a flamboyant guy, you know, ostentatious. He had a piranha tank in his office, like he was that guy. His dad was a little bit more low key, but Tony definitely watched them and saw their success and, you know, saw that they had nice houses, drove nice cars, wore nice clothes, they had money. Tony really wanted in on that, but he didn't want to have to work either. He was inspired by the hustle, but he wanted quick money, you know? So he did kind of whatever he could, I guess, like nightclub type things. And no shade to people that work in nightclubs, but he was the type who was like selling drugs, shady stuff. Once he was more successful with his night time activities, <laughs> he did go into real estate. So once he got into real estate, this was probably like the mid 2004, five-ish, so like he graduated high school 2000, the robbery happened in 2010, so like this was like 2005, six, seven-ish, and this was the era of the subprime mortgages. You remember this? Okay, so he was able to invest in real estate pretty easily around that time, but when the bubble burst in like 2007, 2008, he was stuck underwater in a bunch of mortgages. He ended up having to sell his own house. All of his rental properties went into foreclosure. In May of 2009, he filed for bankruptcy. After being defeated by the real estate business, he decided to sell whatever possessions he had left and he took that money and moved to Las Vegas to start over. All right, so once he got to Vegas, he enrolled in the University of Las Vegas with the eventual intent to go to medical school. Now, I don't know if he was a good student, but that's not the vibe I get. He had moved in with his father, who was a municipal court judge. <laughs> oh yeah, baby. Oh yeah. 
So Judge Daddy gave him an allowance of $1,000 a month, which when you have no other living expenses, you know, that's not a bad deal. So this guy wasn't some hard scrabble kid who suffered like a rough childhood, you know. He was a spoiled ass brat who suffered from affluenza, as far as I can tell. You know what I'm saying. Tony the egomaniac held it together for about a year or so and then he started slipping into his old ways. He was always surrounded with women and he was very much into pills and cocaine. He was spending more and more time in casinos and he was just watching those high roller tables with like heart eyes. I mean just look how easy it is for these card sharks. You know, they just eat up the drunk tourists and they just take the money. Tony is very enamored with big personalities and big money, more importantly. So he took his little bankroll, whatever he had left from selling his stuff back in Colorado, and he set off to become a high roller too. Did, did he have a mentor? Did he know what the F he was doing? No. Did that stop him? Also no. And he very quickly lost all of it. So being such a spectacular failure, he was embarrassed and angry. Well, then he started thinking if he can't win the games, he should just take the cash. I mean, what's stopping him from just like taking the chips, the poker chips, just take them. So by this point, you know, he's like overwhelmed with this fantasy, I guess, of just going into a casino and just taking what he wants and leaving. As nutso as this guy was, he, he's not the dumbest. So he started off at the Stardust and he took cash and that also bolstered his confidence to go to the Bellagio in his biker getup and take all those poker chips. So he's got $1.5 million worth of poker chips now. They're essentially worthless. So he started coming up with some plan to cash them in. This motherfucker went back to the Bellagio the night after he robbed it. Can you believe that? He said in the interview, with Rolling Stone that he, quote, felt like a big swinging dick. <laughs> I just jacked this place and now I'm gonna cash in everything I took. Well, he went to the Bellagio and once inside, nobody noticed him. He was like, well, obviously he wasn't wearing the, the biker outfit. He was just plain clothes and nobody swarmed him. Nobody came after him. Nobody recognized him. So he was just like, yeah, fuck yeah. Okay, so he's inside, he's looking around, nobody's, noticing him, no one cares. There's no like wanted posters or anything, which by the way, they don't do that in casinos. It's not a, they don't do that. Well, that night that he came back to the Bellagio, he had brought that bankroll of the stolen money from the Sun Coast. So he went over and bought a seat at a high stakes poker table. Now, as the game went on, he started slipping in some of his stolen Bellagio chips, like big chips, like $5,000 each chips, but it's a high stakes table, so like, no big deal. Now the casino didn't seem to be paying attention, right, to who won or lost in the poker room at that point. So he was essentially able to launder the chips, although it was a pretty slow process. Okay, so if you're not following, I was confused too. You don't have to go buy chips first. You can just sit down at a table and just put money on the table. So when he won back chips, he snuck in the stolen chips. See what I'm saying? He laundered them. I mean, he obviously couldn't just take the chips to like the cage and cash them out because they would know. <laughs> All right, so this little laundering process seemed to be working, but he definitely was not patient enough to get through a million and a half dollars worth of poker chips. And also poker games don't typically move fast, even the high stakes ones. So he picked up his shit and went over to the craps table, started making moves. All right, well, he dick swinged on over to table five, the very table that he robbed, by the way. And like I said, obviously there's no like wanted posters of the biker bandit there at the Bellagio. How embarrassing for them. But that doesn't mean that people on the floor weren't talking about the biker bandit. On the gaming floor, it was like all anybody was talking about. Think about it, like the freaking Bellagio, the legendary right, was robbed just like the night before to the tune of $1.5 million. The players were talking about it, the dealers were talking about it. It was a hot topic and Tony was loving it. I mean, what an ego stroke, right? Not only are people talking about it, he knows it was him. He's right there with them and they have no idea. 
he's really gassing him up, okay? Well, he's having a good old time and he's really like making big moves on the craps table. Well, the, the pit bosses started to notice him, but not for the reason that you think. This time, it's because he was winning. Now, I wouldn't know this because I'm not a gambler or a lucky person in general, but <laughs> when you start winning in a casino, they notice and they start hooking you up. Well, they want you and your money to stay in their casino so that you could eventually lose it. <laughs> what's that What's that saying? The house always wins? So the Bellagio Hotel and Casino put him up in the high roller suite and comped him dinners. So over the next several weeks, Tony's dream became a reality. He was living the high roller life. He was totally blowing through the money, you know, the strip clubs, all the things. And don't forget, he has all those stolen chips still. So the Bellagio game system definitely keeps records of high level players, high rollers, right? Definitely people who are using crayons. Well, Tony's name was not on that list, but the casinos know who they've been giving those chips to. They know. So Tony was definitely smart enough to not cash out the chips because they would find out for sure who he was and what he did. But he was burning through them on the casino floor like they would never run out. So during this gaming rampage, he was out of his mind on drugs. He wasn't really that good of a player, remember? So he was losing big games, but he didn't seem to care because why would he care? It's not his money. He even flew some friends out to join him, some friends from back in Colorado. They said that they watched him play and make crazy bets and lose. Crazy bets like $10,000 on a single hand of blackjack. Now, although they were also enjoying the wild ride, they grew worried that Tony was in trouble. You know, he's taking a lot of drugs, he's pale and sweaty and not sleeping and it's bad, you know. They actually ended up getting into a little bit of an argument, you know, when it was time for them to go back to reality in Colorado. They fought in the car on the way to the airport you know, they were worried that he was gonna overdose or something, but anyways, they went on their way and Tony went back to crazy life at the moment. Well, meanwhile, big law enforcement is definitely investigating these robberies. In fact, some big clues were popping up, like about a week after that robbery at the Bellagio and during Tony's drug-filled haze, a Salvation Army bell ringer tried to cash in a crayon, a $25,000 chip that somebody had dropped into his bucket, which we now know was Tony. The ringer had no idea who dropped it in, but... Oh, I wish I knew if they gave him the money. Probably, probably not, huh? Also, a tip came in to police from a poker dealer on the Bellagio floor uh, about a player at one of his tables who had told him about how he had fallen onto hard times and how he just had fantasies of just snatching up people's poker chips and running out. And not just any poker chips, cranberries. Then later that poker dealer saw that same player, but this time he had a lot of money and he was buying into games with cash, not chips. Well, that tip led detectives pretty much straight to Tony Carleo. So investigators started to look into him and they were doing the math, you know? He was somebody who recently filed bankruptcy but now he was a high roller, but not on any of their lists. Suspicious. In fact, when they pulled his player records for the past four years, he had lost under just $3,000 at the casino. And since the robbery, he had lost over $100,000. Oh yeah, people, when you cash in, they keep records. They know. Okay, so anyways, Tony is up in the high roller suite, just living the life. He only ever left the casino to pick up stolen chips that he had kind of stashed around town with friends or to unload laundered cash. But because he was such a freaking maniac, within a few short weeks, the smallest value chips, the ones that were super easy to turn into cash, the like the $1,000 chips, they were gone, okay? So he was out of ammo. By now, all he had left were crayons, but without the ability to unload them or cash them out, I mean, they're just a bunch of tiny plastic coasters. So also, Online poker forums were talking all about how the biker bandit could possibly unload the stolen poker chips, you know, just speculating. Well, Tony was watching those discussions very closely and his dumbass joined in the conversation under the username OceanSpray25 in the location Crenada. Good one, good one. 
he wasn't just watching, this ding dong was engaging with people, right? Having conversations and messaging people who were tossing around hypothetical scenarios like how many essentially worthless crayons might this biker bandit be willing to trade for a real chip that could be cashed? So a member of the forum who was like a casual player that lived in Virginia someplace named Matthew Brooks exchanged messages with this Ocean Spray 2.5 and eventually was given a cell phone number to a burner phone, presumably. Now, he was curious as anybody would be. He called the number and during this 15 minute phone call, the guy on the other side described the robbery in great detail. Now, at this point, everybody knows the details of the robbery. So Brooks wanted more proof. Well, Tony's stupid ass went home <laughs> This is so funny to me. So Tony's stupid ass went home and he took a picture of a note, like a handwritten note with two crayons attached to it. And then he emailed it to Matthew Brooks from his home email. Also, are cranberries good for the liver? I don't know things. Okay, so anyway, of course, Matthew Brooks sent the photograph to the Bellagio and to the Las Vegas Police Department. The IP address from the email took them straight to Tony's father's house. Judge George Assad, by the way, a judge, remember? What a ding dong. Six weeks have passed since that big hit on the Bellagio and Tony Carleo is living it up in the high roller suite, strung out on Oxycontin and sitting on about a million dollars worth of crayons that he can't use, and he's running low on funds. So one day, while he's seated at a poker game downstairs on the gaming floor, an older player sits down next to him and strikes up a conversation, introduces himself as a doctor, and that he heard he had crayons for sale. And he had a friend from New Jersey that was in town that was interested. Was it the drugs? Was it desperation? Was it ego? Tony agreed to meet this guy. Wealthy, a free spirit, and her ex-boyfriend was a club promoter. Red flag. <laughs> you idiot. So this New Jersey guy was introduced to him as Dominic. He claimed that he was in the loan sharking business back east and that Italian American like Jersey energy, right? That Tony was in love. I mean like not literally, but caught a vibe. <laughs> well, Dominic was a cop. Duh. He was a career undercover cop named Mike Gennaro and his entire operation, this sting operation, I guess you could say, was being funded by the Bellagio. Now, even though Tony really liked him, he was squinting a little bit. So Dominic started to lay it on thick, like three C's thick. He took him to steak dinners, they went to strip clubs, they gambled together, and Tony told him all about his recent streak and how he'd gambled away $70,000 on New Year's Eve alone. Over the next couple of days, they started to work out the details to exchange the crayons. On January 30th, Dominic finally made his move. So one night at dinner, Dominic passed the wine list across the table to Tony and said, there's some nice selections in there. Probably didn't sound like that. <laughs> there's some nice selections in there. No? Don't, don't try to do a Jersey accent? Okay, got it. Okay, anyway, so Tony opens up the wine list and inside of it was $10,000 in cash and some smaller chips. Tony took out the cash, slid the wine list back across the table to Dominic and inside of it was a crayon. Sale made. Well, that wasn't the end of it because over the course of the next couple of days, Tony sold his new BFF like three more chips. All in all, it totaled about $100,000. They would do most of those exchanges out of the eyes of the camera, so like inside the casino bathrooms. So after their last casino bathroom exchange, Dominic went out the door and then a swarm of cops came into the bathroom and took Tony to the floor. Face to the bathroom floor, to be precise. Gross. With Tony now busted, totally busted, and facing like a long list of charges, he appeared in court and apologized and told the judge that he had been very foolish. He entered into a plea deal of guilty of felony armed robbery and assault with a deadly weapon for the Bellagio robbery. He later pled guilty to similar charges from the December 9th robbery at the Suncoast. 
entering that plea deal was in his best interest because it dropped several of the other associated charges, including like weapons and drugs. After Tony was apprehended, about $375,000 of the Bellagio chips ended up not being recovered. Tony's father, Judge George Assad, lost re-election to his bench seat that year uh, after holding that position for about 11 years. In a statement, Judge Assad said, quote, I can say that as a prosecutor and judge, I have always felt people who break the law need to be held accountable. Well, that's nice. Tony Carleo was sentenced to a combined nine years in Nevada's Lovelock Correctional Center and was ordered to repay the casinos a total of just over 800 thousand dollars. And that is the story of the biker bandit. Thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you want to see more videos like this one, then consider subscribing to this channel before you leave today. I upload new videos here every week and you can follow me on all of the social channels. <laughs> if you want to know what makeup I use, just check down in the description box. I will link everything of interest for you. Also, don't forget about merch. The links to merch, including my collaboration that I did with Murder Apparel, is also listed down in the description box. It's pretty remarkable that I don't have lipstick on my teeth. Not yet, anyways. That's it for now. I will catch you next time in the next video. Bye! Pew, pew, pew. Can you hear me? Am I too loud? Jadaro. Is that the right color? Absolutely not. This eyeliner fucking sucks. Trash. That sucks too. Felt tip eyeliners are inferior. I will die on this hill. Going through the money. Whoa. <clears throat> now Unky, Unky, <laughs> Unky Lily of downtown Puebla. Carleo. The Carleo. Carleo. <laughs> <laughs> this makeup does not look good. Don't look too close.